Well, I thought I'd start by saying how this retreat came to be. Because um, when I came to visit Venerable Chanda from uh, Australia, and she said, well, in that case, we've got to do a retreat together. You think of a topic. <laughs> and so, so that day, I had gotten a call from, well, someone I know very well is in prison. And he's in prison for something he has done. And, um, and uh, he was going through a very difficult time that, at that time. And my, um, anyway, someone else who I know very well was, was uh, um, well, of course, it's very difficult to forgive yourself, especially when it is something you have done wrong. And so it came up to my mind, you know, um, how much we hold on to what we have done wrong. This one thing, admittedly a difficult thing, that he has done wrong, but how much we have done right, you know? We do so many good things in our life, but it is the one mistake that we hold ourselves in prison for. Sometimes we are in prison, but sometimes we hold ourselves prisoner. So this is something that I think we all do to some degree or another, hold ourselves prisoners for some one small thing we have done wrong, when there are so many things, so many things we do right. And this particular person has a difficulty. He ended up in prison for Really, it, it is a mental illness, you could say. And in fact, a, a, a lawyer was saying that 90% of people who are in prison really shouldn't be there. They're there because of solvable problems. And often it is um, society not being able to cope, them not being able to cope with society and society not being able to help them. So, um, um, so yeah, so this topic of forgiveness came to my mind. And I thought of the many other times that I've heard of, oh my goodness, how we hold on to my, our pains, because um, there's, a, a, well, a, shall we say, another person I know very well, who, who was, a, a, you know, has had a lot of difficulty with her father. Her father had affairs when they were little, when, when, um, when she was little, and she um, said, he's ruined my life, you know, I never had a childhood because how could I trust this man? And so to this day, she can't, she can't have a proper relationship, she doesn't have a proper, you know, a, a partner, and um, she said, he ruined my life, and then I thought, well, you know, you're ruining your own life, you're holding on to this this anger towards your father, and it's, he, you could say he should apologize or you, he should uh, behave in a certain, you know, he should, he should at least admit to what he has done and that he has hurt me so badly. He hasn't, you know, he should say so, well, all these things. And I said, and I thought to myself, actually, it's we when we cannot forgive the person who has hurt us, we are the ones who, who are in pain, and really, it's a great burden. So, um, so these stories, and another one that comes to mind is that, again, another person I know very well, I hope they don't listen to these talks, they'll recognize themselves. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, your stories are the people you know very well. Anyway, uh, who, you know, we enjoy being the victim. All his life, he has had the father who was not good to him, the professor who, you know, was, he, he was hard done by, but the boss who, who, who um, you know, just was wrong and bad. So, so it goes on. We enjoy being, we 
we have this identity. I am the one who has been hurt. You know, people have done me wrong. And sometimes it's a, you know, in this case, sometimes we learn that. We learn that through our society that we have to, uh, that in, injustice is, is, is wrong. We have to, um, uh, we, we have to remember the hurts that the others have done to us. We keep wars going on generation after generation. In Sri Lanka, I don't know, maybe a thousand years later, we are still fighting the same war that we did against, you know, the Tamils and the Sinhalese. We keep remembering they did this to us, and we tell our children that, and that our children tell our, their children that, and so it becomes part of our identity to be the ones who have been wronged. So. Uh, Seeing this also in myself, this tendency to want to somehow create a sense of identity around being hurt. And we enjoy it, you know. We somehow take pleasure in repeating the same story over and over to ourselves and feeling very sad and miserable. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, sometimes it's fun, <laughs> but sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes it just, it drags us down and we don't see life anymore, you know. The, the, the clouds are always hanging and, uh, you know, the, there's always a grayness to the world. We never see the sunshine. And uh, so I thought, well, I suggested to Venerable Chanda, oh, I was thinking about forgiveness. And she wrote it down. <laughs> she put it on the internet, and there it was. <laughs> no technology. <doesn't> <laughs> so here we are, and I hope this um, is something that is useful to you as well, because, like, uh, um, like I think we all find it difficult to forgive at times. Often it is ourselves. So I thought I'd share with you some of the ways that I've been trying to work on this for the last, I don't know, 20 years of my life, or as long as I've been practicing, in different ways. And perhaps afterwards you can share as well what, what has helped you. Um, anyway, so I, I, I thought i start again with my very first person who I know very well who's in prison. And um, and uh, so often in prison you get called up for you know you you get called up and the first thing you think of is that oh my God what's going to happen now because it's often you know little small things or maybe not small things because you have done a crime and um, that you. Uh, something in you know something you haven't followed in your daily supposedly things you're supposed to do in prison and so every time this person is called up his heart palpitates you know oh my god what is it this time and how often do we do this you know every time you're called up by your boss oh my god what is it this time or the phone rings and you go oh my god what is it this time so um one day this person he suddenly thought you know, he sat back and he looked back at the whole couple of months since he was last called up for something and he thought, you know what? I haven't done anything wrong. Why am I worried? And uh, so this is something we never think of. I haven't done anything wrong. And when we are called up by somebody and, or someone says, you know, what, you know, what's going on? How come this something, something wasn't done. You can look back on yourself and you go, well, have I done anything wrong? You know? And um, often when we look back at, at, our, at our days, so we forgot something or, you know, we didn't really mean it. And so this idea of non-remorse is something that the Buddha really uh, reminded us of that 
to reflect on what we have done and if we have not done anything wrong, this is a cause for rejoicing. So um, this is such a simple practice that none of us ever, ever consider that when um, we go through the day, we remember the one thing we shouldn't have said or the one thing, you know, we forgot, but we forget the 99 good bricks that Ajahn Brahm talks about. The good things that we did, the nice, the good, the, the, the opening the door for someone, helping someone that needed a hand. Um, so many things we do during the day, we never, ever, ever stop to recollect that we have been doing good during the day. So uh, I thought I'd share that with you because that is such a simple way to feel good about ourselves and something we never ever think of doing, isn't that so? We never ever think of sitting back and going, God, I, I didn't go and I didn't murder anybody today. <laughs> I thought about it, <laughs> but I didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we, uh, to, uh, yeah, to use it as a practice, freedom from remorse, to look back on our day and think, well, I didn't actually do anything wrong. I'm sorry, I have to say it's really hard to give a Dhamma talk to a fan playing in the background. <laughs> but anyway, so, um, so, yeah, so another, an, uh, another thing that I do to uh, help me forgive is to watch inspiring people. Like I often watch videos on that, you know, Titnahan gives, the Dalai Lama gives, just being, you could say it is surrounding yourself with good friends. They have so much available online, and we have amazing human beings alive today to not draw on their power and to not draw on their example is like, you know, it's like, it's, it's, it's silly not to. So quite often what I do is I just click on just inspiring videos and watch how, like, I guess that's how I meditate as well. Just watch them. How do they interact? How do they live their lives? What are they saying? How do they, how do they seem to live in the world? And uh, like I said, some of the most inspiring people for me are the Dalai Lama and uh, Titnahan and, uh, uh, you, you know, uh, Gandhi, so many people, um, Nelson Mandela, people who have, despite being, having so much injustice done to them, can turn their lives around, can completely, utterly forgive and completely, utterly uh, um, not hold anything against those who have harmed them. So I don't know if any of you do this as well, but I find it very inspiring rather than watching endless silly videos online <laughs> to, to actually, uh, uh, inspire yourselves, Ajahn Brahm as well, you know, he is always consistently kind. He doesn't seem to judge anybody and he accepts everyone as they are. So, uh, yeah, the uh, um, um, filling your mind up with all these, all these, uh, um, good examples, you know, what do we do with our spare time? We could just sit down to meditate and think nonsense. Or you could just watch an inspiring movie, simple as that. <laughs> so, so um, anyway, the other day I was, uh, again, getting ready for this talk. 
and uh, I was watching a, a, a video by Titna Han, and someone had asked him uh, again about forgiveness. And this is this is this I found was yet another amazing story. It was the story of um, uh, a man during it was it was a uh, army officer in the in uh, uh, during the Vietnam War. So he was an American officer who had uh, um, well anyway his. His uh, barracks were uh, bombed, and many of his fellow soldiers had had uh, been killed. So he was extremely angry, and so one day he put poison in the he made some sandwiches and put some kind of arsenic or something in the sandwiches and left these sandwiches outside the village of one of those Viet Cong um, villages that had, had, uh, had um, um, uh, thrown bombs on his, on his barracks. And so he saw the children come out and see these sandwiches and he had, he, each of them took a sandwich and they, 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 they bit into it and he, he he sat back and he watched the whole thing. He watched as all these children came and had sandwiches. And each of them then started to have stomach aches and their mothers came and they couldn't do anything about it. And each one of these children, five children died. So the war ended, he went back to um, America and needless to say, he held this in his mind all his life, that he had himself murdered five children. So uh, Titna Han tells this story because this man comes to his, uh, they had a, a, war vet, a retreat for war, vet, war veterans and this man comes to his, uh, came to this retreat and told his story. So, so he listened to his story and said, well, it is true. You have to acknowledge that this is what you have done. But he said, I have a suggestion for you. From this day on, your job is to save lives. So he said, why don't, he suggested every day to send money or become involved in a charity that saves lives, set, that saves children's lives. So every day he started, I think, working with children in Africa or something like that. I can't remember the exact details. But every day he became involved in saving a life instead of having killed a life. And so this is, you know, all of a sudden, his life was about having done good things and not about the remembering all the bad things he had done. Um, and so we can do this as well, you know, for all the times we have hurt somebody or, or um, caused harm, we can instead do something positive. We can uh, help somebody who has been um, in the same position as someone we have hurt. So I often think, you know, of um, this person who is in prison. He is in prison for something that really only he understands how he got himself there, and he only he understands what it is to be in that position, and so. Only he has the capacity, like nobody else can, to help somebody else who, has, who is in the same position he is. So when we have suffered, we have the capacity to understand somebody who is suffering just like us. And 
we are in the position to help them like nobody else can. And so we can use our pain, we can use our difficulties to transform other people's lives like nobody else can. Isn't that true? So we use our suffering and we, can, we use our suffering to truly help other people because only when you have suffered can you really understand where someone else uh, what someone else in that same position feels. So uh, I often think of that myself when I med when you know when when you're meditating and you kind of go like, wow, what kind of an idiot am I? How come I'm thinking about this over and over again? Why can't I just go into jhanas like Ajahn Brahm? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but then I think you know. Because I've gone through all this painful process of meditating, I understand other people who can't meditate. That you, uh, you, you learn skills because you have suffered. So, uh, yeah, that's um, another uh, way I reflect on when things are going wrong, when, when I have been hard done by, I go, I understand. I understand what it means to be in pain. I can help somebody else who is in the same boat. So, um, yeah. So, just to, uh, just to, anyway. Gosh, I've gone through two of my three of my sto stories. <laughs> yeah. So all, all these are, all these, they're just, you know, in the end, what makes it difficult to forgive is because it requires a piece of ourselves to disappear. Something in us, we, we want to somehow be in control, isn't it? We want to somehow be the ones that fix ourselves up. We want to be the ones that can manage our minds, can, uh, can uh, uh, fix up the world, get things right. And in the end, we've got to be able to let that little piece of ourselves go, to be able to let go of control, to be able to let go of the one who is in charge and, and uh, learn to not, learn to, learn to, learn to, learn to disappear, ultimately, isn't it? Learning to let a piece of us, piece of ourselves go. So Venerable Chanda talked about uh, what the Buddha teaches about non-self, that all of us are really made up of causes and conditions. And there really is nobody essentially there in charge of our minds, nobody essentially in control. So if we can understand um, more and more that if we let go of our uh, desire to be in charge, our desire to control ourselves and the world, that if we allow ourselves to feel the ebbs and flows of life, then we are more able to forgive. And we are more able to allow both the good and the bad in the world to come and go. So, uh, yeah, these are a few of the ways that I use to, to learn to forgive, to, to uh, practice forgiveness. And um, yes, <laughs> General Chanda helped me make, make notes <laughs> because it's like, I'm not going to be able to talk for 45 minutes on this. <laughs> and so um, one thing I was telling her about was was uh, um, what it feels like, you know, to have forgiven. Because 
like I said, when you hold on to these grudges and these, these hurts, there's always a cloud hanging over you and you never quite see the sunshine. You're kind of covered by this grayness, which you don't really know that you have. And so when you, um, when you let go of, of this sense of self that has been so hurt, all of a sudden you start to see reality. You start to see the world how it, as it is. You, start, you, you feel lighter and you feel, um, you see the sunshine. <laughs> and you are uh, able to really see the Dhamma because the Dhamma is, um, is, is nature, you know, is things arising and they pass away. And we never see that when we are caught up in our own little worlds. So being able to forgive and being able to, uh, to uh, let go, we finally get a chance to see the Dhamma. We get a chance to um, see reality. We get a chance to see that Things arise and they pass away. And really, we had such little control over it. It was happening anyway. So we learn to let life be and we learn to be um, uh, less in charge, less in control. And we finally start to see the Dhamma. So... Yeah, so, um, so anyway, so this is the topic of forgiveness. <laughs> that uh, These are the few things I've been reflecting upon. Like I said, it was a little bit difficult to have music in the background. My brain didn't quite come together. <laughs> but I uh, tried my best anyway. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. So I... Uh, just to recap, anyway, just to recap, now that the music has stopped and my brain is kind of working a little bit better, <laughs> uh, just to recap that some of the, the, again, you know, the reasons for forgiving was because it creates a sense of identity and we carry this identity, we feel that we have been wronged and we never see the sunshine we never see we never see reality we just live in this this world that we have created and so forgiving is important and i shared with you some of the ways that i've found useful to forgive was uh, uh, first of all remembering that we actually do a lot of good we actually don't ever, rem you know, we remember the one mistake that we make, made, but we forget the 500 good things that we did that were quite, you know, really quite, quite all right. And the fact that we haven't hurt anybody. We haven't, um, quite often, we didn't say the word that we wanted to say. We didn't um, act out when we, we so wanted to. So that freedom from remorse is actually a really, we don't reflect on it. We don't um, make use of the fact that we have been good people. And also to, to, um, to inspire yourself, like I said, people like Thitna Han and Dalai Lama, to reflect on their lives. I read biographies. I love reading biographies of great people. And to emulate them and know that we can be that too, you know, just and to know other, you know, it is a possibility of the human heart to be able to forgive. So surround yourself by goodness, surround yourself by good people, and uh, remember that you have that same capacity in your own, own heart. Um, yeah, so, and also that if you have suffered, you are in a, you have the ability to help somebody else. You have the ability to understand 
like nobody else has. And you also have the capacity. If you have hurt someone, do something good instead. Help somebody who would otherwise never receive help. So uh, I thought I'd, I thought I would finish and lead you up to the next meditation. Now that the music has stopped. <laughs> Uh, we can meditate again. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I thought I'd read out a little, um, a little, you could say, prayer that, uh, that um, a friend of mine once gave me. And it's, it's again from, from Plum Village. It's got some kind of, you could say it's a, got Christian overtones, so if you have difficulties with that, you can leave that aside. But it's, it's, uh, it's about remembering our own goodness. So Venerable Chanda's meditation is going to focus more on uh, remembering our good qualities. So I thought I'd kickstart that by reading out this um, very beautiful poem from Titnahan. So, so we can close our eyes or, or uh, just take a deep breath and uh, yeah, listen to these beautiful words. Blessed ones who dwell in the world, teach to us compassion. In this and countless lives before, from beginningless time, our mistakes have caused much suffering to ourselves and others. We have done wrong, encouraged others to do wrong, and given our consent to acts of killing, stealing, deceiving, sexual misconduct, and other harmful actions among the 10 unwholesome deeds. Whether our faults are known to us or whether they are hidden, they have brought us to the realms of hell, hungry ghosts and animals, causing us to be born in places filled with pain and suffering. We have not had the chance to realize our full potential. Today, we are determined with one pointed stillness to repent the obstacles of our past unwholesome actions. Blessed ones are our witness to look upon us with compassion. We surrender before you and make this aspiration. If at all, in this very life or countless lives before, we have given even a handful of food or simple garments, if we have ever spoken kindly, even if only a few words, if we ever looked with eyes of compassion, if only for a moment, if we have ever comforted or consoled, even if only once or twice, 
if we have ever listened to wonderful teachings, even if only to one talk, if we have ever offered a meal to monks and nuns, even if only once, if we have ever saved a life, even if only that or of an ant or a worm, if we have ever recited a sutta, even if only one or two times, if we have ever been a nun or a monk, even if only for one life, if we have ever supported others on the path of practice, even if only two or three people. All of this merit has slowly formed wholesome seeds within us. Today, we gather them together like a fragrant flower garland and with great respect, we offer it to all awakened ones. Our contribution to the fruit of the highest path, opening our hearts wide to the perfect highest awakening. We are resolved to attain great understanding we will realize compassion and embody deep love. We will practice, it, practice diligently transforming our suffering and the suffering of all other species. Please transfer the merits of body, speech and mind to the happiness of all people and all other beings. Apart from the thirst for great understanding and the embodiment of love, there is no other desire within us. All Buddhas in the three times and the ten directions have offered their merit as we are doing today. Repenting all our faults, we joyfully contribute to the immeasurable ocean of merit and the towering peaks of the highest understanding. The Buddhas and the ancestral teachers are the light which show us the way. In this solemn moment, with all my life's force, I come back to myself and bow deeply with respect. So I will end there and pass it to Ven Wilchanda, who will um, do a guided meditation on. We will see. <laughs> Thank you.